Hi, welcome to the Recovery Daily Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Abbasi. I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic and stroke survivor. And today I want to talk about um, some stuff that came to mind this morning in my morning meeting when the book Spiritual Awakenings um, referenced a a poem by Emily Dickinson. And I love Emily Dickinson. I always have. And I think I wanted to be Emily Dickinson when I was growing up because I think I've mentioned to you guys that I wrote like hundreds of poems when I was younger from about the time that I was in high school through my 30s. And I felt like, you know, I felt like what I was writing down was like full of passion and was unique and was just like, if anybody knew this poet, poetic, um, just emotion that I felt is, um, they would just be so just in awe, you know, well, my poems weren't great. (laughs) And, um, my emotions were no different than what everybody else was feeling. You know, does that make me feel bad? No. Um, writing those poems was what helped me get through those years of my life. It really was. Um, I don't know what I would have done if I didn't have poetry because it really helped me in my earlier years. And I just was obsessed with it. As I was um, very interested in reading Emily Dickinson's poems and trying to figure out what it was that she was thinking and feeling and stuff like that. So when it comes up, like I grab a hold of it. And so it came up today, Emily Dickinson's poem about wading through grief and how even the smallest feeling of joy can make grief even more difficult. So um, I actually looked up a an analysis of the poem because um, I really wanted to see what how somebody else would word what the poem was about. And I agree with this analysis. So it's not my analysis, um, but it's one that I completely agree with. And so I got it off of, just to give credit where credit is due, I got it off of poemanalysis.com. And uh, the poem is, again, by Emily Dickinson. And I think it's called, I Can Wade Through Grief. Yeah, I Can Wade Through Grief. So um, I want to explore how this poem, what it really means, um, and the beauty of how she words this, and then how it resonates with me and how I apply it to recovery and, you know, maybe a little bit about just holding on to grief itself, like when somebody passes away and how much I am so familiar with that feeling. I had somebody that was important to me that passed away the year that I graduated from high school and I never grieved it. Um, I drank. And so I felt like that's what I was doing for all of those years. I was just holding on to that grief and I was using it as an excuse to pour me through life. And, um, So then every bit of grief that I could cling on to over the years after that, I would cling on to it. And it's just like I was a magnet (laughs) for grief and um, I fed off of it and I was comfortable with it, even though it didn't feel good. I felt comfortable with not feeling good. I felt like that was the way life was supposed to be for me. So I'm going to explore holding on to grief and anger and um, and also use a metaphor um, that's related to the plane pull that was at Dulles Airport yesterday or yeah, yesterday. So um, anyway, how we can 
learn to let things go. So the poem, Wading Through Grief, this is the first part of the poem. It says, I can wade grief, whole pools of it. I'm used to that. But the least push of joy breaks up my feet and I tip drunken. And so the story in Spiritual Awakenings talks about that, how much that is uh, the alcoholic who wrote the story, how much that resonates with him. And um, so Emily Dickinson is describing her ability to endure deep, overwhelming grief. And she talks about wading through whole pools of grief and has grown accustomed to that heaviness of sorrow. But what is interesting, and I can really seem to relate with this, is how she describes joy as something that is destabilizing. You would, excuse me, I had my ice cream um, cone before I started recording. <laughs> so I've got a little burpy burper. Um, I, you would think it's the other way around, but she talks about how comfortable she is in the heaviness of sorrow and that joy is something that's fragile and destabilizing. And this least push of joy makes her trip all the, um, as if it, uh, breaks her down in a way that grief doesn't. And the, what it makes me think about is how when, when I'm feeling depressed and something good happens, it feels like, well, that's great, but it's not going to last. Or that's great, but something bad's about to happen. You know, just wait, something bad will happen after this. It's like, it's, it's, yeah, de destabilizing. It's like, it's fragile in a way that it's, um, it's short lived. And it's not something that almost that I deserve even. And it just resonates so much with me when like before I got sober, how I felt and in the stroke recovery, how I feel sometimes about how I'll get to the point where I'm feeling good, you know, and I'm feeling grateful um, if I, hadn't have had my stroke, I wouldn't have all of this time to do these things that I love. Like do I have a quilt that I'm that I'm um, preparing to sew. And I have a dresser that I'm upcycling and making it super pretty um, and all that stuff. But yet I have these times when like yesterday, I told you how I walked my dog and I felt like um, it's terrible to live this way, right? So it's just, it, I'm so unstable right now as far as feeling, I, I'm not in a permanent place of I'm relieved from depression. You know, I feel like I'm still at this point where if I don't practice my program, if I don't come here and talk about what I'm feeling, if I don't go to my meetings in the morning, um, and if I don't talk, I talk to my sponsor tonight and I talk to a neighbor tonight and I feel really good right now. And I think it's because I talked to my sponsor for a while, for like an hour, and I talked to a neighbor after that. So I feel like I'm a part of right now. And I get to these points where I'm in the house, I'm not working, and my head hurts, and I start feeling sorry for myself, and I start feeling like 
well, nothing good ever happens to me. And if something, you know, if I'm like, oh, I'm really enjoying making upcycling my dresser, I'll think, yeah, but I'll be done soon. And then what am I going to do? Or, um, yeah, just like, it's not, it's not important. You know, what I'm doing isn't important. And I'm like downplaying the, the joy downplaying the, the excitement that I get from doing these simple things. So I felt like I, I feel, I felt like when I was drinking, I could carry the weight of pain and suffering. It was what I was familiar with. It was what I was always holding on to. And that's what I wrote all these poems about. And then when moments of happiness or optimism would come, I almost don't even know what to do with it because I don't believe that it's going to stay. I I don't know how to hold on to it. I don't even want to hold on to it because I feel like it's going to be ripped away from me. That's how joy used to feel for me. And I am trying really hard to not get in that mindset in stroke recovery um, because when good things happen, I need to embrace them and I need to add it to the list of things that I have to be grateful for. And I feel like that's what resolves that issue of being so comfortable in grief and feeling that joy destabilizes me. I think the solution in all of that is gratitude. So joy feels fleeting. That's the word I was looking for. And it almost makes me feel off balance, you know, much like this description that she's talking about, Emily Dickinson, when she says, but the least push of joy breaks up my feet and I tip drunken, um, almost like somebody who had been drinking, you know? And then if you really more literally look at the poem, it's like, it's like drinking, um, because sometimes some people are very much triggered by happy joy celebrating. And so the slightest a uh, feeling of joy and we tip off balance and fall drunken, you know? Um, so there's lots of different angles that you can look at it from. So um, one thing that I was thinking of as, as it compares to this pl plain pull is we, um, I saw the sign for the plain pull on Friday. So I knew that it was happening Saturday. And so this morning when we were talking about this topic, I remembered that sign and it's like a charity event where you have teams and there's like employees for different companies and they build teams and they name their team. And then you get um, in front of a full-size airplane on the tarmac and you all grab a hold of a rope and you are literally pulling the plane. And um, I think like the winner is whoever pulled the plane the furthest, I think is what it is. So it got me thinking about this metaphor of holding on versus letting go. And um, in sobriety and stroke recovery, holding on to grief and anger and resentments. I mean, that's more related to sobriety, but the grief part is really related to stroke recovery, loss, all of that stuff can feel like you are trying to pull an airplane, you know? Um, it's like what I was thinking about was grabbing hold of the rope, like expecting to pull the airplane, but you're not doing any action. You're just holding on to the rope and you're squeezing the rope, expecting the plane to move when really 
the only way to move is to let go of the rope, right? Um, so it's exhausting to just hold on and squeeze and not actually take any action. And I have spent so many years of my life doing that, trying to pull a plane that wasn't meant to move, you know, wasn't meant to move that way. And I've learned that the power in moving forward is not in trying to pull harder, it's in letting go of the rope. And this connects to Dickinson's poem as she describes that feeling of tipping over and becoming drunken at the touch of joy. Like joy, like pain, has the power to shift us. Um, but instead of resisting it, you know, um, we need to let it in. So trying to control and hold on too tightly to our pain and our old ways is very uh, similar to, or opposite, whatever, of resisting pain, re resisting joy and not letting it in. Um, so trying to hold on to this stuff pulls us further into that pull of grief and letting go is where the real strength lies uh, actually. Um, so in the next part of the poem, it says, power is only pain stranger through discipline till weights will hang. She suggests that power is gained through pain, but also that discipline is ne necessary in order to endure pain. And it rings true for anyone in recovery, um, whether it is in sobriety, recovery from illness or trauma. Um, it takes discipline in order to navigate the struggles of recovery and to face each day with intention to either whatever your case may be, stay sober or to make progress in recovery, to heal and to not give in to either old coping me mechanisms or giving up. And it's important not to, not to hold on to the, the grief the, that weighs us down, you know, the grief about what we've lost. Um, because the only way to build strength, to be stronger, is to let go of that and and take on the discipline. Like pulling the plane, we can feel stronger by holding on to the grief, you know, like showing that we're tough. But the power is the strength is not in holding on it's in the discipline and letting go when it's time to let it go um there is i think a time that is appropriate for letting something go there is a time that i think it's important to process um, but I think processing is very different than holding on. And I think that it's important, at least in my case, to talk to a professional, um, whether it was a um, addiction therapist that I talked to, um, 
when I was getting sober or when I talked to my psychiatrist about, because I felt like I was holding on, but I wasn't holding on yet. I was processing and I wasn't done yet. And it's okay for it to take a long time to process this kind of pain, um, this kind of loss. It is grief and I can get comfortable in it um, because I have spent years in grief, swimming in it. And because it is like my old friend, I was really afraid that I wouldn't get back out of that pool if I got into it. You know, if I stayed in too long, I was afraid. And that's why I reached out to a psychiatrist because I wanted to make sure that I was doing this right, that I'm processing my emotions right. And I, it's not that I was doing it wrong, but I really needed help. I needed somebody else to help me process it. And as much as um, support groups and my sobriety meetings help me because I'm talking to other people that are dealing with the same thing. I need to talk about my unique environment, um, my unique experiences as they apply to what I've gone through. And that pushed me a little further because, um, <clears throat> yeah, we're not unique, but our experiences are unique and I needed to understand like, how do I apply, um, some of my character defects, some of my things that are not defects, but they are in my character, like my, um, my need to always be busy, you know, my, my need to, yeah, I mean, that's a perfect example. My need to always be busy. I don't think that that's a character defect per se. I actually am pretty proud of that fact, but how do I apply that to my situation when I'm feeling frustrated that I can't do a lot of stuff? Um, so I needed to talk to a specialist to help me understand how to live on a daily basis with these things going on and what was going on inside of me and outside of me. So, um, so how can this poem serve as a lesson in recovery rather than discouragement? Because when I first heard it this morning, I was like, oh, well, that's dark, you know, that we're, you know, she's comfortable being in grief and the slightest bit of joy makes her have a harder time dealing with grief. But I think it, it really resonates with me in a lot of different ways. Like I could take a different perspective, multiple different perspectives on it, but for me, like recognizing the balance between pain and joy. Um, it's funny that I just said balance because my meditation today was about balance. And anyway, I won't go down that road. But um, pain and pain like grief and anger can be something that we become so familiar with that we get comfortable sitting in it. But it's not something we should sit in. And it's not something that we need to hold on to forever. And although joy can feel unstabilizing, destabilizing at first, when you're going through something that's really, really difficult, it's something that I need to learn how to accept, like lean into it. Um, I am learning how to make stroke recovery life version, Rachel version 3.0 better 
than Rachel version 2.0. That's really what this is about for me, um, is letting that joy in and not thinking, well, this is fleeting. It's not going to, you know, if I feel this good stuff, then it's just going to be even harder to go back to my grief. Well, I don't have to go back. You know, I don't have to go back to it. Um, in recovery, we talk a lot about letting go and not holding on to things that weigh us down, whether it's resentments, fear, or grief. And letting go um, is really making space for that joy and serenity to surface. That's what it is. It's getting out the God box if you need to. And, um, and getting the stuff out of here and out of here and into that box so that you can have that joy and serenity surface and, and have it stay there, hold on to that. Um, and the more that it happens, the more comfortable that I have become sitting in it. I don't feel like joy and serenity are fleeting anymore. I don't feel like joy and serenity are something that are external to me that I'm lucky if I get. That's not the case for me anymore. I feel very strongly that joy and serenity are what live inside of me and my decisions, my behavior, my practicing the program, the principles and all of my affairs that I get to learn how to surface joy and serenity more and more. So it becomes my comfort zone. And that's where it is starting to become. I was talking to my sponsor about that tonight. So, um, yeah, I enjoyed that. Um, maybe we should have a Emily Dickinson series. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I'd have to really rely on other people to analyze the poems and then apply it to recovery and, and uh, to sobriety. So, um, which is fine. That's acceptable because we can do whatever the hell we want here. So thank you for listening to the Recovery Daily Podcast. I say that every night, but I truly, truly appreciate that you take time out of your life to connect and figure out how we could all heal together. So thank you. And I will talk to you tomorrow.